Welcome to the Waking Up Podcast. This is Sam Harris. A few questions about my Ask Me Anything episodes have come in. Um, I announced recently that I'd be making my AMA podcasts exclusively for supporters of the show, and some people have grumbled about this. Uh, even some of you who support the show have told me that's not what you want, uh, because one of the reasons why you are supporting the show is to make it freely available to everyone to people who are just discovering it, to people who can't afford to support it. Um, And I totally appreciate that sentiment. But there's actually a deeper issue here. I'm trying to inspire a culture of sponsorship, which cuts against our tendency to expect everything for free online. And human psychology being what it is, only a tiny percentage of people will be moved to fund the creation of content that they can get for free, without any other incentive. When we did the online survey to gather information about my proposed live podcast tour, one of the questions we asked was, do you support the podcast? And if not, why not? And the responses to that question were fairly eye-opening. Of course, many people said they simply can't afford to support it, Even giving a few dollars a month would be a real sacrifice. And many felt bad about this. And my response to that is, don't be insane. That's exactly why I'm happy the podcast is free. And even if you're not in that situation, if you're giving a few dollars a month to this show, and that puts you anywhere near the edge of your comfort zone, stop supporting the podcast. I don't want anyone making a tangible sacrifice to support this show. But if you're getting enough value from this show that you're happy to treat it like an extra cup of coffee once a week or once a month, and you're fortunate enough not to have to do the math on that to see whether something else in your life will be affected, okay, well, then your support is hugely appreciated because you really are making the show possible. But please do not support the podcast if it's a stretch for you at all. Now, there was another common response to the survey. And I've got to think these people were millennials. Perhaps not. But many people said essentially, Dude, I don't pay for digital content, and I will never pay for digital content. Or they said, Why would I pay if it's free? Free means I don't have to pay for it. Now, again, this is a cultural problem. There's a lot of confusion here about where the future of digital media is going and about what it will take to make it a good future. So there's a lot I could say about this, but I'll just make one point here about why having a listener-supported podcast is good. One of the amazing things about producing this show myself and about not having sponsors, is that I'm not accountable to anyone other than to my audience. I can say anything I want. I can explore any topic. I can talk to any guest. And whatever happens here, no matter who gets offended, no one can fire me. Only my listeners can fire me. And the truth is, you can't even fire me. I mean, some of you can stop supporting the show or stop listening. In fact, a good number of people have done just that because of what I've said about Trump. But even my offending a significant part of my audience can't put the podcast itself in jeopardy. I am completely free to take the conversation in any direction I want. There is almost no one who you get your information from or your entertainment who is in that position. There are no talk show hosts or academics or journalists who have that freedom. One of the most popular questions currently on my Ask Me Anything page is about Reza Aslan getting fired from CNN this week. Many of you want to know what I think about that. And I was going to save that for my AMA, but but it's relevant here, so I will just tell you now. As I'm sure most of you know, there's no love lost between me and Reza. In fact, I think I even say something critical about him in today's interview with Graham Wood. 
Reza is, without question, one of the most unethical people I have come across professionally. But nevertheless, CNN gave him a show called Believer. I only saw a few clips, which I found very entertaining, but for reasons which I think Reza would not have been entirely happy with. But the first season of Believer was apparently successful, and so CNN renewed their order for a second one. And then Reza went a little nuts on Twitter and said some derogatory things about President Trump. And they were not very clever or insightful things. I think the tweet that got him in trouble was one where he called the president a piece of shit. Reza is not exactly Oscar Wilde. But then he apologized publicly for losing his cool. And I think he did this fairly quickly. And despite his apology, CNN still canceled his show. Now, many, many people got in touch with me about this. And the general assumption was that Reza's firing would make me very happy. After all, one of my most malicious and unprincipled enemies seems to have gotten what he deserved. But the truth is, it didn't make me happy at all. CNN hired Reza for the wrong reason, and then they fired him for the wrong reason. Everything about this situation suggests that there's something wrong with our media. Of course, I recognize that CNN can hire and fire whomever they want, but we're talking about a few tweets directed at a president who is driving half the world insane. And Reza apologized, okay, something that I've never known him to do. And I actually think his apology should have been sufficient in this case. And the fact that it wasn't, and CNN still canceled his show, doesn't bode well for our public conversation. There's been a bunch of other firings like this of late for even more trivial statements. And in this case, CNN is clearly playing it too safe. And that's something they think they need to do because they're worried about their sponsors. Well, I don't have to worry about my sponsors. So I can say whatever I want here. And that's why this forum is so useful. That's why I can engage any topic I want without worrying that someone will disapprove or that my publisher will cancel my contract or that my university will fire me or that YouTube will suddenly demonetize my videos. None of those things can happen. So I'm in a truly rare circumstance of total intellectual freedom. And honestly, I'm just beginning to figure out what to do with it. And those of you who are supporting the show are making that possible. So once again, I want to thank you for that. Today I am speaking with Graham Wood. Graham is a national correspondent for The Atlantic magazine. He has written for The New Yorker and The Wall Street Journal and The New York Times and many other publications. He was the 2014 to 2015 Edward R. Murrow Press Fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations, and he teaches in the Political Science Department at Yale University. And he's the author of the book, The Way of the Strangers, Encounters with the Islamic State. And we get deep into his book and into the worldview of ISIS. We use ISIS and the Islamic State interchangeably. And we talk about his experience reporting on ISIS, the myth of online recruitment, uh, how to challenge the theology of ISIS. We talk about the quality of ISIS's propaganda. And Graham reveals the identity of the most important American recruit to the Islamic State. And we spent a long time talking about the surprising significance of Jesus and the Antichrist under Islam. So there's a lot here, and Graham is an amazing authority on these topics. And it was a great pleasure to finally get him on the podcast. So... Without further delay, I bring you Graham Wood. I am here with Graham Wood. Graham, thanks for coming on the podcast. Good to be here. You have written this wonderful book, The Way of the Strangers, which is all about the Islamic State, its rise, and you get right up to the point where its fall seems plausible. Things have moved on a little bit since you published the book, but it's just a really entertaining 
and deep introduction to this phenomenon of, of just global jihadism more generally than ISIS. But you get into the details in a, a very accessible way. And it's, the book is structured around some very engaging profiles of people and also fairly amusing profiles of people who you have spent some time with. So my first question for you is just as a journalist, did you feel that you were taking much personal risk reporting this book? I always worried a little bit about what might happen because especially meeting someone for the first time, you, you never know what he or she is going to do or what friends that person's going to bring along. Um, but ironically, reporting on the Islamic State has been one of the safer assignments I've had. Being in war zones where you don't know where the bullets are going to be coming from, you don't know who you're talking to, uh, it is, is often a very dangerous thing. But talking to ISIS supporters is often an experience of subjecting yourself to proselytization that they are really eager to deliver. So it would be weird for them to attack me if I came to them and said, honestly and verifiably, look, I want to know about ISIS. They are on this planet to oblige. And so they, uh, in general, are, are, are pretty happy to talk. That comes through in the, the reporting. You, the, you have these really adorable encounters with people who just have endless disposable time to indoctrinate you. And then you, you describe their apparent loss of enthusiasm once it's clear that you are not a good mark for this. But they, they clearly want to get their message out. And I guess we should say that you, you are reporting these stories not from ISIS-held territory. Well, it, it can't be taken for granted that someone won't do something horrible to you in Australia or in Egypt or in Turkey or in the United States, for that matter. And most of the people I spoke to did say, I should go to Syria. They said, you know, we understand you'd be afraid to go there, that you think you might get enslaved or beheaded. But if you went there with permission, unlike how James Foley went, you'd, you'd be okay. So the most dangerous encounters that I had we're probably in places that we don't otherwise think of as terribly dangerous, like maybe Norway or Australia or the United States, where you're, you're going to a cafe in a part of town that you don't know, and you never know if there's going to be a van that pulls up next to you and pulls you away. Um, that, that was always a danger, but in the end, I was, I was mostly just in danger of being overfed by these people. Mm -hmm. That's an interesting point, this idea that if you went to Syria, or Iraq, and spoke to ISIS directly, you'd be safe if you did it through the appropriate channels. I was amused and slightly alarmed to see that John Walker Lind from his prison cell was somebody who was advocating that you do that. He seems completely unrehabilitated, Lind. Uh, to, to remind people, John Walker Lind was the often referred to as the American Taliban. He was this young man from Marin County as everyone should know, a bastion of privilege, who decided to go fight with the Taliban very early on, I mean, before September 11th. And in the aftermath of September 11th, he was caught fighting for them, was quickly prosecuted, and has disappeared into the bowels of our prison system. It sounds like he's still there, quite full of faith and happy to advise you to go talk to um, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi if you can manage it. Yeah, the way that I interacted with John Walker Lind was as follows. Uh, he's been in prison since 2001. I wrote to him and said, look, there seems to be this phenomenon called the Islamic State, and a lot of people who in some ways are kind of like you have gone over there. So given that you're still on American soil, and given that you're reading this letter that I've sent to you in prison, apparently you can, you, can be, you can be reached. So do you have anything to tell me about what you think is motivating people and what the Islamic State's all about? And the letters that he wrote back were uh, friendly, um, maybe a, a little bit officious, and were, but were saying, in essence, that the Islamic State would respect its covenants, he believed, if I went to them and said, look, I'm a journalist, I'm curious about what you're doing, can I go over there and, and have a kind of guided tour of the caliphate? And yeah, I told him, that's not going to happen. I, I'm, I'm not going to go over there and just... Uh, take their word for it that they're not going to behead me. And he said, well, you know, it's really the only way to find out. And trust me, they, they, they seem like men of their word. So it appears that these 16-odd years that he's spent in prison 
uh, has not disabused him of the jihadism that he had, had uh, pursued with the Taliban. Instead, if anything, he, he's gone from being a Taliban supporter to perhaps an Islamic State one. Now, have there been journalists who have followed that path? I know there's that, the, the one German journalist, I think, who, who crossed into ISIS territory and, and met some people, although I can't remember if he did that with any permission. Is, is this, has this theory of, of Lin's been demonstrated? Yes, and it's been um, so far verified in 100% of the cases, which is one case. Uh, the guy is uh, Jürgen Todenhofer, who's an elderly German magistrate, kind of a amiable weirdo, uh, very interesting political figure who, who's interviewed Bashar al-Assad and who wrote to a bunch of German jihadis who were in ISIS territory and said, I'd love to go over there. Can I, can I come? They brought him over, showed him the city of Mosul under ISIS control. He took a bunch of, uh, a lot of video. And it, it, from the sounds of it, I, I spoke to him about this once. Up until the very last moment that he crossed the Turkish border to safety, he wondered whether they might kill him. And even while he was over there, they said, look, we will respect the permission that we gave you from the office of the caliph himself to come over here and, and keep you safe. But we promise you, eventually we're coming to Germany and uh, your name will be on our list. Right, right. That's tr always charming in a host. I will keep you safe here, but I'm coming to kill you where you live. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's hospitality of a sort. So uh, just to, to rewind here, just to give people a little context, because I, I will have introduced you in my intro to this episode, but you initially got into this research. You, you wrote a cover article for The Atlantic magazine about ISIS a couple of years ago, and that, at the time, I believe was the most read article in the history of the magazine. It, it may still be, although I imagine you've had a little competition in the last couple of years with the, the rise of Trump. And now you have gone on to write this book. You and I actually did, before I had a podcast, you and I did an, a long interview where I, where I interviewed you on, for my blog. That covers territory that I don't think we'll really cover again in this conversation, so people can, can go seek that out on my blog if they're interested. Let's, let's, let's just start with the emergence of ISIS, and, and then I think we're, we're going to get into current events pretty quickly here. But the birth of this group is fairly astonishing. You report on how ISIS conquered Mosul with a force of something like 500 or 1,000 men and put the entire Iraqi army to flight. It was almost a proof of their divine aid in some way. I mean, it was just like this miraculous display of cowardice on the, on the part of a, an army that, that we had trained. How do you explain that first moment? It wasn't actually that surprising to me. I was in, um, in Mosul in early 2013, end of 2012. I believe I was the last American reporter to be in, in Mosul. And my experience of the city, even then, and remember, this is like a year and a half before ISIS took control of the city, was that everybody was afraid of what they were then calling al-Qaeda. They were saying that uh, shopkeepers would be extorted. And if I, as an obvious foreigner, was spotted on the street, there's a really good chance I would get kidnapped. Um, so even back then, there was the sense that there was no law except al-Qaeda's, except ISIS's. And there was definitely no respect for the Iraqi army. So when ISIS came to town and actually took over the city with you know, four or 500 guys, a bunch of pickups, machine guns and so forth. It was like, yeah, this was a city that, that, that was anarchic before, and they were almost just making it official. But didn't thousands of troops just flee outright when these 500 men showed up? Yeah, and the troops who were there when I was there in 2013, was they, they were garrisoned in just a couple spots in the city. They were considered tools of a Shia sectarian government. Mosul's mostly a Sunni city. And so it, it, it wasn't as if they were doing foot patrols, winning hearts and minds. They, they were considered just those people in a barracks over there who we never see and we would never trust with our safety. So just imagine a, a bunch of Sunnis come to town. They say, we represent your interests, you, the Sunnis of, of Mosul. Uh, and those soldiers over there, we will let them run away, most of them, and we'll control your city. How would you like that? And a lot of people in Mosul just said, well, that, that might be better than the status quo. So I, I think that, that explains how they were able to take over so much so fast. 
Now, how many people at this point have emigrated to join ISIS? Is is the figure still around 40,000? Yeah, 40,000 is about right. They, in the middle of last year, told people not to come anymore. So you can expect that the numbers haven't risen too much. And a lot of those 40,000 are already dead. But yeah, from overseas, from countries that are not Iraq and Syria, usually the, the number quoted is 40 to 45. Now, one of the things you do in your book, which many people decline to do, is you, you, you get into the heads of these guys in a way that is that allows you to see the world from their point of view. And when you do that, the behavior of these people becomes fairly logical. The mysteries begin to evaporate once you begin to take people at their word when they tell you over and over again what they care about, what motivates them. And it's amazing to me. I mean, this is something that has now astonished me for going on 16 years since September 11th. People just find this virtually impossible to do. Scholars of religion or seeming scholars of religion decline to do this. Political scientists routinely prove themselves unable to do this. And you have a, you have a quote here, I think it was fairly early in the book, that I loved, which is, when someone says something too evil to believe, one response is not to doubt their sincerity, but to expand one's capacity to imagine what otherwise decent people can desire. That, I concluded, is the proper response to the Islamic State. And your, your encounters with these people just become this exercise in accepting their account of themselves. You pressure test it in a variety of ways because the, no account is free of internal contradictions. But it's just, from my point of view, a very satisfying excavation of a worldview, which you tackle again, through, through many of these profiles you do with jihadists of various commitment. You know, you, you gave a list of a few disciplines that have been neglectful in their duty to explain some of these things, religious studies, political scientists, and, and so forth. And in, in some ways, I've taken to heart messages that they've given about Muslims in other contexts that they seem not to have applied themselves in this one, which is that we in the West, non-Muslims, uh, secular academics, we ha- have uh, taken it upon ourselves to speak on behalf of um, people from far off lands, from brown pe- uh, for brown people, for Muslims. And so part of what I was doing was just heeding the, the call to instead listen to them, let them speak for themselves. It's not as if I, by examining their socio- socioeconomic status or the political um, circumstances of where they come from, can expect to just understand what they uh, believe about the world. I will be able to understand some things, but why not talk to them? Why not let them speak for themselves? And so what I ended up doing was, I I think, an exercise that was as much anthropological as journalistic. It was trying to uh, describe a culture, a mindset, a view of the world, and to to describe it in a way that the, the people who were speaking would recognize as accurate or at least interesting. One thing that is, I think, surprising or will be surprising to many of our listeners is that this myth of purely online recruitment is, in fact, a myth. There's this picture that has emerged, which is that people get recruited entirely on the basis of online contacts and they have no affiliates in the real world that could explain how their their sympathy got bent toward jihadism. I'm sure there there must be some pure cases of that where it really is a an internet phenomenon, but for the most part that is a myth. Yeah, for the most part that is nonsense. The idea that people will just go on Twitter and be told ISIS is the way to go, uh read these websites, read Dabic magazine and get a ticket to Turkey and you're on your way. That is not how it goes in, as far as I can tell, almost any cases of men. Um, I'll get to women in a second. Usually for, for people who go over there, they know somebody who's already gone. Obviously, there was an, a, an, a first mover, someone who <laughs> went over and told his buddies, hey, it's really nice over here. There's a, a, a house that I got as soon as I arrived and, and that kind of thing. But in general, 
there's there's someone who you've met outside the mosque or in a cafe or on a sports team, and that person has has done something important in, in showing you that an, a human being can go over there. It's not it's not gods who have gone over, but uh, people like you and me, and that that changes everything and and every, everything flows from that. Now, in the case of women, a little bit different. Um, you could look at the women who were recruited to Al Qaeda. And first of all, there aren't very many of them. Al Qaeda was like a, a military organization. It was very male, and it it mostly thought of women as um, as encumbrances because they they wouldn't be fighting. Whereas with ISIS, they're trying to create a society, and so they they need men, they need women, they need children, uh, and so they've had to reach out in different ways. And for that, online recruitment has been really really valuable. Um, they've been able to talk to people who otherwise would be in very conservative milieus where it's not like they could go talk to some stranger, leave the house whenever they wanted. Um, and so online, you can find people who are purely online recruited and who eventually made it to Syria if, if they're women. So focusing on the men for a second, the impulse for a woman to join the Islamic State, I, I must say, is it remains a bit inscrutable to me. But for the men, it really doesn't. And at one point, you talk about what jihadists in general do, and, and, and ISIS has taken this to the point of perfection, is that they, and this is a quote from you, they weaponize a fanatical sense of shame by declaring that jihad is the only absolution. Talk about this notion of shame for a moment, because it probably doesn't have a reference point in the ears of, of many of our listeners. When I was being recruited to an ISIS-like organization, this was before the time of ISIS, I, I was in Cairo speaking with a, a guy I could only describe as a master recruiter. And one of the first things that he would try to emphasize to me was that I had done horrible things in my past. He would ask me, wouldn't ask me to confess details of, say, my sexual history or whether I'd used drugs or alcohol or my failings, but he would point out, God has re requested that you not do these things. And there will be punishment for you in the hereafter for the things that you've done. So th he was really trying to emphasize this, this sense of deep, deep sin, which I think is familiar to almost anyone who has gone over to ISIS. ISIS says exactly the same thing, that God is watching you. He is nearer to you than your own jugular vein, is one of the most famous lines from, 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 the, uh, from the scriptures that, that ISIS likes to, to, uh, to invoke. And so when they say to someone, especially someone who has an especially sinful past as a rent boy or drug addict or what have you, then part of their appeal is that they can absolve you from the sins of your past. You know, if you die in battle, you don't have to pay the bill when it comes to Judgment Day because you're a, a martyr and you get fast-tracked straight to paradise, whereas people who die comfortably in their beds they do have to go through an absolution process, a purification, a, a kind of uh, burning limbo before they enter the gates of paradise. Yeah, don't, don't their ribs get crushed together and cracked at the, the moment of the Day of Judgment? The, the recruiters love to talk about the, the lurid punishments. And yeah, there's something called the punishment of the graves. Um, this is not just, by the way, an ISIS thing. This is part of a fairly orthodox reading of, of the idea of the hereafter in Islam, that when you die, like you get trash compacted within your grave and you scream as your ribs crack and eventually touch each other. And the only ones who can hear this screaming are animals and genies. Um, so there's all sorts of bad things that happen to you after you die, unless you are one of two categories, a martyr, someone who dies in the course of jihad or in a few other categories of death, and uh, a prophet, which none of us are. So if, if you have a, a sense that, that you've got a, a steep, steep bill to pay in the hereafter before you go through the pearly gates, then uh, you have all the more incentive to die faster and more gloriously to, to avoid paying that bill. It's a dine and dash theory of the hereafter. I feel like I'm paying that bill on the jujitsu mats. No one hears my screams, not even the genies, when I get crushed. But you can always tap out. You can't tap out when uh, the creator of the universe is doing it to you. One hears. No, not when he's got you uh, in a rear naked choke. You can't do anything about that. This is something you keep confronting throughout the book. You continually bump into the problem of 
arguing against the Islamic State's theology. And unfortunately, it's a non-trivial problem. It's a problem that, as I said, many scholars and many mainstream Muslims shirk. And I guess the pun on the Arabic term for polytheism should be intended there. So many so-called moderate Muslims and their apologists just lie about the doctrines from which the Islamic State is drawing its inspiration. At one point, you quote the head of CARE, the Council of American Islamic Relations, claiming that there are no end time prophecies in Islam. I hear people like Reza Aslan say that the Quran abolishes slavery, right? There's no support for slavery in, in Islam. Countless people have said that ISIS has nothing to do with Islam. President Obama quite famously said this over and over again. One reason why I think Hillary Clinton lost is that she seemed inclined to follow that quite delusional line. And rather than talk about the actual link between specific doctrines with respect to martyrdom and jihad and apostasy and blasphemy and all the rest, and this death cult behavior, people reflexively talk about U.S. foreign policy and the Ba'ath Party and bad people who would do bad things anyway, right? This is just religions being used as a pretext. They claim that ISIS has no theological justification for its actions. At one point, you quote somebody, I think it was a Guardian writer, who even argued that ISIS drew its actual inspiration from the French Revolution and from, from you know, the scientific enlightenment. You have people like Tariq Ramadan saying that ISIS is not a religious phenomenon. It's purely political. I mean, there's just this tsunami of obscurantism that rises up every time a person attempts to talk about the theological roots of this phenomenon. So how have you encountered that obscurantism? And, and were you taken in by that initially and then gradually deprogrammed through your encounter with sincere believers? What was that like for you in terms of disabusing yourself of that myth? I had the fortune or maybe misfortune of encountering ISIS-like beliefs or jihadist beliefs abnormally early in my life. I, I was about, let's see, 20, I was 22 years old when I first met someone who was a follower of bin Laden. I was at a conference in Peshawar, Pakistan. I was just a backpacker passing through, but there was a conference going on, so I was curious what was there. And it, it was a basically a bunch of jihadists who were getting together, and they were, in fact, addressed remotely by bin Laden himself. So I got to talk to people, and from that early stage, I already had a sense that there was more to jihadism than just political grievance or any of the other things that you listed. And there was certainly, among the people who were part of that group, a an absolute devotion to Islamic scriptures and to interpretations of those scriptures that have been around for a long time and are not made up out of thin air in the 20th century or 21st century. So um, that came first for me, and some of the apologetic efforts uh, hit my ears well after and and well after I, I knew what the the responses were from from the jihadist side. Um, for me, it it, it was. It was so, uh, the response was so ubiquitous. Every side was, was saying, especially in this country, that ISIS was not a religious phenomenon, uh, that ISIS was best understood in, 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 in ways that had little to do with the history of Islam, except for some extreme Islamophobes, of course. So that sentiment was, was, was so constant uh, that for me, what was much more interesting was to find the Muslims who were actually opposed to ISIS and who, unlike the ones who would say, hey, slavery has been abolished in Islam permanently and forever, and, uh, or that ISIS has, has no knowledge of its scriptures, was to find the ones who didn't have that, uh, that level of ignorance or willingness to lie about the, about the history of the religion. And there turned out to be a lot of them who had arguments against ISIS that came from an Islamic perspective uh, sometimes a very conservative, possibly even jihadist Islamic perspective, and to ask them where they got those ideas as well. Much has been made of the fact that some recruits to the Islamic State were found to buy books like with titles like Islam for Dummies, as though this proves that religion played no real role in their behavior because they obviously didn't understand their religion all that well. 
or that in some ways their their claims of a religious motive must be insincere if they're buying books like that. And again, this is precisely the sort of point that I've heard someone like Reza Aslan make on television, right? I notice you dispatch that idea at some point in the book. Dispatch it here, because that, that has always struck me as a fairly crazy and, and in many cases, insincere point. Yeah, there were, there were a couple guys from Birmingham, England, who were trying to get to ISIS territory and had in their Amazon.co.uk shopping carts the Quran for Dummies and Islam for Dummies. And ever since then, you hear this invoked as evidence that these people uh, know nothing about Islam, have no interest in Islam, um, and it's, it's obviously just not so. Um, the, the idea that, that, first of all, that someone who is reading books about Islam has no interest in Islam is, is self-evidently uh, a, a non sequitur. Um, but beyond that, you have to understand that the amount of time that, ha- that someone has spent as a devoted jihadist or pious Muslim is, is not correlated with the intensity of their feeling of, of devotion or, or, or piety. Um, I think a lot of people think that, that how do you judge whether someone is a believing Muslim? Well, you look at time in grade. How long has this person been identifying as a Muslim? And the answer for many ISIS supporters, it's true, it's rather short. But how intensely do they believe this? Quite a lot. Um, so you find people like Mehdi Hassan, now of Al Jazeera, who will, at any chance, invoke this example. We should say now of The Intercept, right? Isn't he, isn't he writing for The Intercept? Yeah, I, I think he's Al Jazeera and The Intercept now. And any time you, you, you talk about this, you're, you're likely to hear someone, not always Mehdi, say, look, this is, this is an example of, of how foolish these people are. And I'm not saying they're not foolish. Um, I would just point out that, that educating yourself, reading books about Islam, is the sign of someone who actually cares a lot about this stuff. Now, the other point that people will make about someone who's reading the Quran for dummies is uh, that this person is not a learned Muslim. It's, he's not a, a sheikh or, or a, an al-Azhar trained theologian. And I would not deny that. Um, what I, th- I think people, people miss from this, though, in their zeal for denigrating the, the followers of ISIS, is that it, in any human population, you would find some people who are uh, novitiates and some people who are a small fraction of people who are learned scholars of, of, of the faith. You know, you could go, as Rukmini Kalamaki once said to me, if you went to a small town in Italy and you approached people coming out of Mass on a Sunday and you asked them about obscure doctrines within Catholicism or canon law, the average person would have no idea what you were talking about. Would you then conclude that that person's not Catholic or has no interest in Catholicism? No. The person just came out of Mass and probably identifies uh, very closely with Catholicism, it just happens not to be someone who is tremendously learned. And that's the case, of course, with the majority of, 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 um, of Islamic State recruits as well. Yeah, yeah, it's a very important point, this time and grade illusion that I, I think you've aptly named, it, because the point gets made another way quite frequently, too, which people will say that the person has no background in a madrasa, for instance, right? This is someone who had a fairly secular background, and then all of a sudden has changed his worldview as though no sudden change could be sufficient to count as a real religious conviction. But of course, people have awakenings to one or another religion all the time. And, and when you trace people's connection to the rest of the community, what you find rather often is not necessarily jihadism, but you find a religious context which is fairly conservative by any comparison with even with Christian fundamentalism in the West. And as you find throughout the religious landscape, you find that religious ideas are systematically protected from criticism. So the belief in paradise is endemic to planet Earth in one or another form, and it's certainly incredibly well subscribed throughout the Muslim world among Muslims who have varying degrees of commitment and knowledge about the faith. And so 
people who can seem quite secular still live, in many cases, their entire lives in a context where a belief in paradise and the legitimacy of martyrdom and the divine origin of the Quran and all the, the building blocks of this worldview are in place, whether they've taken a real interest in it or not up until that point. I can give you an example of how some of these ideas go from being dormant to being active. Um, a lot has been said about the apocalyptic side of ISIS. ISIS officially believes that the end of the world is coming, and it's coming at ISIS's instigation, at their hand. And it's not going to be pretty, and it's going to cause the Antichrist to come back, and great battles, and so forth. These are not things that are generally spoken of in mosques. If you go to your local mosque, you're very unlikely to find an imam screaming about the end of the world. Just like if you go to your local church, this is probably not going to be the favorite topic of a sermon for at, at any megachurch. Although there will be a kind of understanding that these ideas are out there. And in the case of, of Muslims, as one scholar told me, this is the kind of thing that, that is told to Muslim kids when they go to bed at night. It's uh, stories to, 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 to make them be um, you know, good kids, uh, to obey their mom and dad, to, um, to think, about, uh, think about good and evil and, and try to develop a moral sense. They, they're not stories that, that are necessarily going to be weaponized into ISIS. They're, they're just part of the folklore of, of, of a culture. Now, ISIS, it finds people who have been told these stories and these are largely benign stories, I think. And then it comes to them and says, all right, all those stories you've heard that were not emphasized by your religious authorities, they're real. They're happening right now. And since people ha have been hearing them over and over again, it's a fairly simple action to, to wake them up to the idea that, that these great battles are happening right now and you better get there soon, otherwise you'll be thought of uh, in the hereafter as someone who ran away. Yeah, well, I want to talk about the end times prophecies in some detail because they really are the goofiest stories ever told. Uh, and, and the fact that anyone believes them literally is fairly astonishing. But before we get there, so you, you, you said that in the course of reporting this book, you encountered people who were not mere obscurantists with respect to ISIS, but still disagreed with them. So you found scholars who, rather than play hide the ball with the Articles of Faith, they dealt with the theology of ISIS in a more honest way. I mean, they would, they would acknowledge, for instance, that the prophet had sex slaves, right? Rather than condemn slavery or even sexual slavery, the prophet practiced it, right? This is unambiguous in his biography, and it's not an accident, therefore, that ISIS thinks they can do this, and therefore the challenge is for honest critics of this sort of faith, to find a theological basis from which to criticize it. How did those efforts appear to you? I mean, did you find people who were offering a counterpoint to the theology of ISIS that you felt could sway potential jihadists? There are a few different categories of, uh, especially from believing Muslims, of believing Muslims who are opposed to ISIS. There would be some whose main effort was to make Muslims look good. Um, I would put as an example, CARE would probably be one organization that, that, that was involved in that and trying to say, look, we are not ISIS. And it's true, they are not ISIS. They're not supportive of ISIS. They are also, though, um, very willing to say things that are false about Islam and that, uh, about the, the history of, of the beliefs that Muslims have had over the years. Another category is of, of people who would, they would not lie about Islam, but they would lie about ISIS. They would claim that ISIS is not, um, doesn't believe what it believes, doesn't say what it says. That's, that's uh, maybe a, a, a slightly, slightly easier to deal with category. And then you'd find others whose, uh, whose knowledge of their own tradition is extensive enough that they, they couldn't possibly simply deny the reality of slavery in Islam, or amputation of hands of thieves, or beheading sorcerers and apostates. And that last category was, was what I found to be the, it was first of all a diverse category. There were many 
different Muslim scholars, Muslims within it. But it was also the most interesting because, as you say, they, they were not playing hide the ball. They were, they were instead engaging in a, in a, a very complicated and uh, sincerely felt battle within, within the faith. And you know, they would, to take the issue of slavery specifically, one of those earlier categories, might have, they might have said slavery has been abolished in Islam. Um, that is true if you think Islam is the governments of Muslim-majority countries. They have pretty much all abolished slavery. It is not true of the tradition of Islam, which has, for most of its existence, recognized the uh, legitimacy of slavery and, and codified the institution. So you, you'd find one of the most distinguished living Muslim jurists, Taki Usmani, a, a Pakistani, who said of this argument that slavery has been simply abolished by the consensus of all Muslims to be, he said, um, so ridiculous it would make a grieving mother laugh. <laughs> that's, that's the person I wanted to talk to, was, was someone who's aware of the place in the tradition and yet was able to give me an explanation of why ISIS's version of this was not okay. Before we go further in that direction, I just want to comment on this impulse that so many Muslims and their apologists feel to, above all, make sure that Islam doesn't look bad or that Muslims don't look bad in the aftermath of a terrorist attack of the sort we've recently experienced. This is so wrongheaded. I mean, there are few things make the community of Muslims look worse then they're reliably lying about the faith. They're lying about the existence of dangerous doctrines which are so easy to find, right? This is, and so whatever the motive for these lies, it can't help but appear sinister. And, and this ritual is now so widely repeated that it's just, it's become a caricature of itself. You know, in the aftermath of an event like Manchester or London, which just happened, you have Muslims jumping on the airwaves, either representatives of care or, or people who claim to be secular, and, and in fact, in many cases, certainly are secular. You've got people like the comic Dean Obadala, you know, who's got a post on CNN, and they, they jump on television, and they essentially say, what do you want from us? We, we condemn terrorism. Look, I condemn terrorism. I'm condemning terrorism. I don't support ISIS. Why is the burden on Muslims to condemn terrorism every time something like this happens? This is, I've hit this before, but I just, I view this as like a public service announcement. The issue is not that Muslims don't condemn terrorism. Condemning terrorism is a trivially easy thing to do. And, I, and, I, and it goes without saying that most Muslims don't support the activities of a man who shows up at an Ariana Grande concert and massacres children, right? That need not be said. But what is altogether lacking is an honest acknowledgement that this violence is arising out of sincere belief in the truth of specific religious doctrines. And that, that is the problem. Muslims don't have to condemn terrorism. They have to condemn the doctrines of martyrdom and jihad, which is a much heavier lift, right, theologically and, and socially. And they, they need to condemn all of the triumphal bullshit about Islam eventually conquering the world. That is ISIS's message, and that's what has to be confronted head-on by honest, secular, liberal, or otherwise conservative and nonetheless tolerant Muslims. And that is something, I mean, I, I feel like I can count on one hand, maybe two hands at most, the people who honestly do that reliably. And this is, this is someone like Majid Nawaz, who gets on CNN and just, you can actually track through his statements and remain sane at the end. So anyways, this is my hobby horse, but it, it just, you know, every time there's a new terrorist event and we see the same shills for delusion jump on television, it really is just crazy making. I'm largely in agreement with what you just said. That I will say, I do get the question all the time, why don't moderate Muslims condemn ISIS? So I, I, I think there are people out there, probably a lot of them, who really think that there are huge numbers of, like, say, 50% of Muslims out there who believe that ISIS is in the right and are secretly staying at home and uh, just keeping their mouths shut so that they can 
wait for the triumphal day when Baghdadi comes to Washington. Um, so th that's simply false. There, there is no um, population of Muslims in, in anywhere in the world that approaches 50% that think that ISIS is just straightforwardly on the right track. Um, but yes, whenever there is a big attack, there is a, a, this dance of obscurantism that does begin where people will say, Muslim or not, by the way, they, they will say ISIS has nothing to do with Islam or they get Islam right. So you'll find Jews or Christians saying that ISIS gets Islam right, as if Jews or Christians had any standing within the Muslim community to say that. One variety of saying that this has nothing to do with Islam is a form of political correctness, and in both good and bad senses, where just as the answer is always no, you don't look fat in that shirt if your partner asks you that question, you can say, well, no, this has nothing to do with Islam. So that's just a matter of politeness. What I'm happy to say is that when Muslim scholars are talking about ISIS amongst themselves, and when they're talking really seriously, you do not find at the highest level of those discussions anyone anymore who says that ISIS simply is, is ignorant, simply is a bunch of Ba'athists. Uh, there are instead, in many cases, they, they will actually now lead the discussion, start the discussion by saying, yes, ISIS consists, is a Muslim organization with sincere belief in the correctness of its interpretation of the Quran and the Prophet and the life of the Prophet Muhammad. People like Hamza Youssef, who's probably the most prominent American Muslim scholar, uh, says exactly that. And an another Sharia scholar friend of mine, he said to me, look, if I hear another Muslim say that Islam is a religion of peace, I'll kill him myself. Mm -hmm. So even within the community, there, there, we've got to a point of, of, within the Muslim community, we've got to a point where people are tired of platitudes about Islam and are much more willing to talk about ISIS's interpretation and, you know, successfully or unsuccessfully try to debate them um, in, in an honest way. Well, let's talk about just the quality of ISIS's messaging and how they've been so successful. And then, and then I think we'll move on to what may be happening now in terms of the seeming fall of ISIS as a caliphate. But everyone is very interested to know what you think about the future of the ideology and, and the phenomenon of global jihad. One thing that I've always thought of as a very bad sign with respect to ISIS is just how good their messaging is. And uh, as I, I once read from an, an issue of Dabek, their, their online English magazine on this podcast, and commented on the fact that one of the scariest things about it, from my point of view, was how good the copy editing was. There were no typos. I find typos in books printed by Princeton University Press, right? I find typos in my own books. Talk a little bit about just how they've managed to bring that level of polish off. They have a magazine called Dabik, which is the source of the article that you read called, uh, I believe it's Why We Hate You and Why We Fight You. And in the earliest days of Dabik, it was a beautiful magazine. I, I speak from someone who, who writes in magazines for a living, and I can say that the, the copy editing was superb. And by the way, it was difficult copy editing. It had um, diacritical marks on the Arabic, and they, they really knew where those were, were to go. It was also well-written in English, very clearly done, and the design was out of this world. I mean, it, was, it looked like a up-and-coming like men's magazine or, or something. It, it, was, it was an extraordinary piece of propaganda. Um, in the last issues of Dabek, and the magazine went out of business at the end of last year, you could see that, that some of the copy editors had... Had been bombed. Yeah. The, the, you, you'd see uh, lines that would run off the end of the page. You'd find typos here and there. And the designers uh, had probably met the same fate. So instead of it looking like a uh, particularly hip men's magazine, it would look instead more like something that, that some high school kids put together at the last minute with their, with their Quark Express or whatever the layout program is, is these days. So it's, it, it has, has changed a bit. But in the early days, they, they, were, they were great at it. Now, the, the piece that you read out, uh, 
you may or may not know this, Sam, but I, I, I believe I have discovered the author of that piece, and it's John Georgeless, the highest ranking American in the Islamic State. So I can say from not just from the piece itself, but from, from all the biographical details I've found out about this guy who's now in Syria fighting for ISIS, that he's a brilliant guy. Uh, and yes, it is deeply alarming to find out that in addition to the dummies they have going over there with the intention of dying as fast as they can, that they've got some people who, um, in an, another set of circumstances, would be doing very, very well in, in academic jobs in the U.S. or, or as computer pro programmers or in, in any number of fields. Yeah, well, I must say I detected some other signs of, of progress in the war against ISIS because I, when I was reading your book, I, I decided to Google someone you described as perhaps the smartest and most magnetic of the preachers there, this man named Turki al-Bin Ali, only to discover that I think he was killed maybe like seven days ago in some drone attack. It seems like they're losing some of their talent. You mentioned this guy, John. John Georgilis, which I wanted, to, I wanted you to talk about him because you, it really was a wonderful bit of sleuthing by which you identified him. Do you recall how you did that? Well, one of the first people I found who could speak to me fairly authoritatively about the ideas of ISIS, the theology of ISIS, was an Australian guy, um, Musa Cerantonio. And I went to Australia uh, more than once to hang out with him and his followers play soccer with them, and uh, just try to absorb what they believed. And part of that was trying to, trying to absorb how they got the ideas that they believed. And um, Musa started talking about a, a figure named Yahya, uh, who was clearly his teacher. He was the person who, if I stumped Musa, which was pretty rare, he would be able to go on his phone and send a message to Yahya and Yahya would answer it. So I, I figured this guy um, at least was one r more rung up the ladder than Musa himself. And Musa at that point w was sort of the unofficial English language translator of the Islamic State. So he, he wasn't nothing. Um, when I asked him, though, about more details, he wouldn't say more except that, that Yahya had been captured by the Free Syrian Army recently. Uh, and uh, I, I, I gleaned that he was Greek. So I, I started looking around for people who had the beliefs that he had and who were calling themselves Yahya and who were Greek. And that, that had to be a pretty small universe. I mean, there, there are not very many Greeks in the Islamic State. Um, and there certainly aren't very many people who believe all the things that the Islamic State believes and, and have the competence to explain why uh, Yahya had all those things. So eventually I found a reference to a guy uh, who had a Greek name and who was an Islamic State ideologue. And his name was Ioannis Georgilakis, which is, again, one of those super unique names. Uh, it's a Cretan name. And so now I thought, okay, there's a guy in Crete who's evidently Musa's teacher. And so I started experimenting with permutations of what an, a convert to Islam might call himself if his original name is Ioannis Georgilakis. And uh, Google was my friend here because there are not very many people who are, are looking for terms that, that, that follow exactly that. And then I eventually found a guy who, who called himself Yahya Abu al-Hassan uh, al-Bahrumi, meaning the, uh, the one from the Mediterranean, and a few other things that were indicative of fluent Greek speaking. Um, then through that, I was able to zero in on what the guy's name possibly was from seeing that he had some English-speaking friends. I figured maybe he might be Greek-American, so Ioannis or Yahya in, in English is John. And uh, eventually I found this guy, John Georgeless, who had been arrested for jihadist activities in the mid-2000s, and uh, eventually was able to, to confirm that that was the guy, the teacher of Musa, and at this point, probably the most important American in the Islamic State. Yeah, that, that is a fascinating path by which you've proven your um, journalistic chops in a way that most journalists can't equal. That's really beautiful. Well, thank you. It, it, was, it was a lot of fun to do because, you know, th this, this world of online jihadist ideology is not huge. And the people in it are such show-offs and such weirdos that they leave breadcrumbs 
everywhere. So yeah, it, it, it felt um, deeply satisfying from a journalistic or Sherlockian perspective to, to figure out the real identity of the guy. So then you went and you, you interviewed his father, right? I doorstopped his dad, yeah. Um, How did you set that up? Did you, 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 did you tell him exactly who you were and what you wanted to talk about, or did you, was there an element of surprise in, in why you were there? It's a sad story. It's, he's a, the only son in this family, and he's never coming home. So when I knocked on the door and said, I'm here because of Yahya Abu al-Hassan al-Bahrumi, uh, the guy who answered knew exactly what I was talking about. And he had a, a, a kind of melancholy exhale before he, he sat down and, and talked with me for a very short time. And yeah, it, he, he knew that his son had gone completely off the deep end when it came to jihadism. Um, but I, I, I don't think he even quite realized that it had, it had led him to the, the preeminence that he had achieved in, in the Islamic State, or even that he had made it to the Islamic State until I informed him of this in uh, mid-2015. So it sounded like from his father's point of view, John wasn't amounting to anything. It seemed like he could have no clue that he had achieved a non-trivial level of expertise in this domain of nihilistic weirdness. His son is, is a, a genuine leader of men and a, has a surprising mastery of, of Arabic. Sounds like he's a, um, extremely accomplished in his own way. And that this, based on what, what you report in the book, it sounds like his, his father would be astonished by this. Yeah, his dad... Um, it helps to know, he is a former colonel in the U.S. Air Force. He's a practicing radiologist right now in North Dallas, wealthy guy um, from a pretty wealthy family. And so, you know, the way that he has chosen, his dad has chosen to, to live his life, it's, it's a fairly tracked kind of career where you, you progress through the ranks, literally, and you can see how well you've done by how far you get. So his son... Um, converted and became a jihadist probably in his late teens, early 20s, uh, and was like full bore into this stuff, but was doing it in a way that it was actually almost invisible to his parents. He was like in the basement hacking on his computer and reading texts about Islam and the caliphate and assembling a following worldwide of people who were listening to him about this. And he, when he would say, you got to go to ISIS territory, they would listen. So it, it, it's almost as if, imagine a very successful father who has his fuck-up son in the basement playing video games. What are the chances that that dad is going to realize that that kid in the basement is the best video game player in the world of that video game? Um, pretty low. Well, the video game that he happens to be playing is called Jihadism. It's called ISIS. And it was a huge surprise. And... Um, an embarrassment, I think, to the family to discover that, that this is what the son had been doing and that's how far he had gotten in it. And this is really one of those cases which it sounds self-serving to say it, and perhaps it is, but I mean, this is the kind of case that proves my thesis about the, the power of ideas. This is all you need to know that the necessary and sufficient conditions for jihadism need not include poverty, or a lack of education, or political oppression, or living in some failed state. If you find specific ideas captivating, sufficiently captivating, that is all you need. And there are so many examples of this pure case where the person has no plausible political grievances, no prior relationships with anything that would make sense of a life deranging commitment to jihadism. And when you look at the bios of even people who are, who are raised in a more traditional Muslim circumstance, disproportionately, these are, these are well-educated people with other life opportunities who become jihadists. They we're talking about engineers and even doctors and people for, not from the poorest families, but from middle-class families or better. So, I mean, someone like John, I recognize in him People I know, frankly, and, or, or even myself at age 20. It's like uh, when I look at what I did I, when I dropped out of college and got really into meditation and spent 
what amounted a ye- to years on silent meditation retreats, that was all defined by the ideas that I, I was finding credible. And then so it is with any human life. And But for the fact that I happened to be into meditation and thinking about the nature of consciousness, and didn't happen to be into thinking about the pleasures that await martyrs in paradise, and the need to spread the one true faith to the ends of the earth, that is the relevant difference, not a background of of subjugation by the Israelis or having been victimized by U.S. foreign policy. So, I mean, I, I find someone like John, on some level, completely unsurprising, even though, you know, it, it is on his face fairly surprising that someone with nothing but a, an internet connection can suddenly become the most important foreign recruit to ISIS. I'm glad you say that about the familiarity of, of John's type and the kind of questing behavior that he had as a teenager, because I, I felt the same way. You know, I, I, I described the way I unmasked John. It was largely through, I was a language nut when, I was, when he became a jihad nut. And I, I, I felt the same kind of satisfaction uh, of kind of discovering a, a, a realm of ideas that I devoted myself to. And it was clearly something that he felt too. It was a, a whole realm of, of, of human intellectual activity that he found just worth throwing everything else away for, um, and because that was one of the requirements of that, of that web of ideas, whereas if you're into meditation or into philology, then there are paths out of it. Um, with jihadism, there was really only one direction it could go, and once ISIS came about, it was like, yep, yeah, this is the moment we've been waiting for, and of course, as soon as he possibly could, he was going to take his family off to Syria and, uh, you know, come pretty darn close to getting them all killed. In fact, it's probably just going to be him. So now what was it like to spend time with Musa Cerantonio? You can remind our listeners who he was. You, you wrote about him in your, I believe, your Atlantic article as well. But he's this Australian jihadist voice. He was more than most people you profile, your, your gateway into the mind of the true believer. What, what was it like hanging out with him? It was lots of fun. Um, Musa was not answering queries from journalists when I first uh, reached out to him. And I think that was because the queries were sort of uh, along the lines of, uh, hey, when are you going to attack next? Um, tell us about your, your plans for world domination. And the questions that I asked him were more like, what do you believe? How did you get to believe these things? Uh, how do you respond to, to the people who disagree with you? And uh, I think he, he, found that, uh, he found that approach irresistible. He has styled himself as a Muslim intellectual for the last five years or so. Uh, he's been an evangelist on Egyptian slash Saudi television. Uh, he's had a, a speaking engagements with major figures in, in India, in the Gulf, in Egypt, in Australia. And he was really eager to have someone sit down and drill him on these questions about what Islam actually requires. Um, he wanted me to, to ask him the hardest questions about the, the original language texts that, he, that, he, was, that he, was, he, was, he was using to recruit people. Um, so it, it was several days at a time of intellectual combat, which is it's a deeply set satisfying thing when you're talking to someone who really believes in what he's talking about. On the topic of really believing what you're talking about, let's unpack the the end times prophecies a little bit because there are two there are two characters that play an inordinate role here at the at the end of the world. The first is the Antichrist, and the second is Christ himself. I think many listeners will be surprised to know that Jesus plays a significant role in the end times from the the point of view of the most true believing Muslims. Well, let's talk about the the Antichrist and Jesus in, in through a Muslim lens, who is the Antichrist and, and where do we think he is at the moment? We think that the Antichrist is chained on an island, probably in the Red Sea. Uh, he's a big guy, has reddish skin. Uh, one of his eyes is kind of droopy. It's covered as if by the skin of a grape. And he's around right now. He's on Earth, and he's waiting for his, his moment to come. And he's been around for, for 
at least 1400 years, hasn't he? Because wasn't he interviewed at some point when uh, Muhammad took the Arabian Peninsula? Didn't someone show up on, on that island and tell the, the Antichrist that the gears of history were, were now turning? That's right. He, he granted, I guess, an exclusive interview to a, a ship full of wayward sailors who were washed up on the island and then met a guy who was horrific. He was described as, as being hairy and you couldn't tell his face from his ass. And that guy said, oh, come on over here and, and meet this fellow who's chained up. And the guy in, in, on the island in chains was the Antichrist. And he, he asked, so has uh, Muhammad arrived yet? And the sailors said, actually, yeah, he, he's in Mecca right now. And the Antichrist said, oh, good. Well, that means my time is nearly at hand, which I don't know if he got it wrong or if 1,400 years just doesn't count for very much in, in the grand scheme of Islam. But the, the next step is after there's a restoration of the caliphate, which according to ISIS has already happened, and big battles between the Muslims and the Romans, which may have also have already happened at, at Dabak, the Romans being uh, either NATO troops or Turks, or depending on what your interpretation is, then the Antichrist will, will sort of appear and uh, a, a series of, of truly catastrophic, weird, apocalyptic events will take place. Um, once the Antichrist frees himself from his chains, there will be drought across the planet. One third of the planet will go without rain one year, two thirds of it the next. There will be a, a severe uh, lack of food, and the Antichrist, among other powers, will have the ability to conjure a kind of like false food and like throw it out to adoring crowds and have them uh, come to his aid. And anyone who opposes him will just get hacked to pieces, cut down. Uh, any Muslims who find him will be able to identify him because he'll have written in an invisible ink that only Muslims can read the word infidel across his forehead. And even illiterate Muslims and children will be able to read that across his forehead. So as he's traversing the earth, throwing out steaks and burgers from his wagon to adoring crowds and hacking to death um, believers, the Muslims will eventually be uh, just a few left. There, there'll be just 5,000 or so left, and they'll be encircled by the forces of the Antichrist in Jerusalem. And then it gets really interesting. So as the Muslims are praying there, um, encircled, waiting to die, Jesus, who, as you say, a prophet in Islam, revered in Islam, second only to the prophet Muhammad himself, will descend to the city of Damascus, not far from Jerusalem, and then hightail it to Jerusalem to the aid of the Muslims who are praying there. And once they recognize him, uh, the, the caliph at the time, who will be a figure known as the Mahdi, will say, hey, uh, you're Jesus, aren't you? You should really lead us in prayer. And Jesus will say, no, no, um, really, it's, it's, that's your duty. Why don't you lead us in prayer? After prayers, though, Jesus will, he, he will not be willing to take it anymore. He, he will go grab a spear, call for the gates of the city to be opened, and run into the armies of the Antichrist, eventually catching the Antichrist as he flees and stabbing him in the back with the spear until the Antichrist, uh, not just, he doesn't just die, he dissolves as if salt in water. And Jesus will hold up the, the bloody spear and say, uh, we win. And Jesus, it's important to point out, not divine according to Islamic theology. He's, he's a, a man like you and I are, and yet he's been hanging around for now 2,000 plus years, having ascended to heaven, wherever that is. We'll have to get Neil deGrasse Tyson back on the podcast to tell us where one could ascend to and descend from when the time is right. Is there any thought spared for how implausible it seems that someone who's not divine could be available for the end times when they take thousands of years to roll around? Well, he's, he's not divine, but he was a prophet. So the fact that he's been spared a human death so far uh, by bodily ascending to, to, to heaven at least puts him in something other than the category of ordinary guy. When he comes back to earth, interestingly enough, that, that 
that bit where I, I said he declines to lead the Muslims in prayers, the reason he does that, according to many interpretations, is it's his way of saying, I'm no longer a prophet. The last of the prophets was Muhammad, so I can't be a prophet. And if I were a prophet, of course I would have led you in prayer, but instead I'm just a guy and we will, lead, we will rule together, the, the, the caliph and I, but uh, I'm, I'm a human being and I'll, I'll die as a human being once this is all finished. But in the meantime, I've got this magic power of terrifying the Antichrist and making him deliquesce once I've stabbed him. I'm still hung up on the, the island in the Red Sea. There's, the Red Sea is not that big, and there can't be that many islands there. It seems like this, this Antichrist could be easily found. Yeah, you would think so. And you know, one of the reasons I enjoyed talking to Musa so much was he took this kind of objection seriously. Um, maybe not as seriously as, as I would have liked him to, but he would bring it up himself and say, look, it's, it does seem weird that a fully charted, navigated body of water might have a island large enough to conceal a guy, but you know, maybe there's a rock on top of the hole that he's been living in. What do we know? If, if we're already in the territory of having to believe things that uh, we don't see with our own eyes, because we're talking about Islam, we're talking about religion, so this might just be one more thing that, you know, it seems weird, but it's not the first weird thing we've had to believe. Another thing like that, the armies of Gog and Magog, who will come and they will blight the earth a second time after the Antichrist, and also after the, the mortal death of, of, uh, of, of Jesus. The Gog and Magog are somewhere in Central Asia, concealed behind an iron wall, a huge iron wall. And you find among apocalypticists in Islam, there, there's often this discussion of, okay, now we, we have geospatial intelligence and satellite imagery where we could see if there was a huge iron wall somewhere in Central Asia. We would have noticed it by now, so what the heck is going on? And often it comes down to this question of, of faith, where you just say, well, God has blinded us to lots of things before. Why not this too? Why, why should we expect that our scientific instruments will be able to do what God may very well not want us to be able to do. This is how faith functions as the ultimate get out of epistemological jail free card. So what is the state of the Islamic state now? So you've written this book, you're, what, what, when did your book come out in hardcover? The book came out at the beginning of this year. So even in the last few months, there have been signs that the, the caliphate is shrinking, at least in terms of its physical territory in Syria and Iraq. What, what is the state of the military assault upon Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi's actual territory, and how do you view the future of the state part of the Islamic State? And then, and then no doubt, we need to talk about the export of this ideology throughout the world into, into what is I think aptly described by Majid Nawaz as a global jihadist insurgency. So I'll say first what the physical reality is of ISIS's control of territory in Iraq and Syria. And then there's this separate question of how they think of it, how they explain it, how they say that, that despite the loss of territory, there is still a going concern. So they've lost huge amounts of territory, especially in Iraq. Uh, they've been rolled back from the high water mark, which is probably the end of or middle of 2015, to a point where they've lost well over 50% of their territory, and they're almost out of their largest city, which was Mosul. It's not looking good for them. I mean, they are, they were able to continue to expand until they got to the farthest reaches of Sunni Arab majority territory. And then at that point, they kind of hit a brick wall. And because of fighting back and better organization among their enemies, they just lost territory over and over and over again. And that's probably going to continue. Um, the city of Raqqa, which has been the de facto capital in some ways of, of ISIS, is in Syria. And it's being encircled by uh, Kurds, Syrians, and others. And it's not going to be an easy fight, but I think eventually we can pretty confidently say Raqqa is not going to be a city that's controlled by ISIS anymore. Now, on to the question of how ISIS thinks of this, because this sounds pretty dire the way I put it. 
to them, first of all, they would say, okay, things don't look good, but we are prepared and expecting for, we're expecting trials. We're expecting God to curse us with failures and defeats. And this is a good thing because it's going to purify our ranks. It's going to make the, 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 the piece of the pie for those who are faithful and fighting for us that much larger when it eventually is, is, is served to us. So they say that if Mosul uh, is a tough operation, then great. If Raqqa is tough, then even better. Remember, when the Antichrist comes, there's only going to be 5,000 of us left. So things might seem bad right now, but they're going to get even worse, and that's all to the best, paradoxically. So tactically, they've got uh, the following view, that when, Mosul be- when, the, when the operation to take Mosul back began, they said, this is going to be our battle of the trench. And in, in that, they were referring to an, an event in early Islamic history called the Battle of the Trench, which is told in a chapter of the Quran called the, the, the chapter of the parties, uh, the different uh, groups that were fighting against the Prophet when he was in the city of Medina. And the way the Prophet fought back w- was to dig trenches around the city so the cavalry was useless in, in trying to take back the city. And what it forced his adversaries to do was to, uh, to dig in for a long war. And because there were so many parties who were making up the, 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 the group of his adversaries, they just didn't have enough political stability to win the fight and to, to, to be there for the long durée. Um, and ISIS thinks the same way. They say, look, we've got a bunch of Shia and Americans and French and Kurds. We've got Jordanians, we've got Emiratis, we've got Turks. They all don't like us, but they also don't like each other. So. If we dig in in Mosul, and they literally dug a bunch of trenches in Mosul so that, that the modern equivalent of the cavalry couldn't get in as, as effectively as it would like, they thought, we're going to prolong this for such a long time that the Iraqis and the Turks and the Americans and the French and so forth won't be able to stand each other, and they'll have to regroup and will effectively have won uh, this round. That's, that's where they are in Iraq right now, is... is still trying to drag this out and make it painful enough that eventually they can uh, declare a kind of, 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 of victory. And even if they lose territory, can um, melt away into the desert where they were before they took over the city of Mosul. So that they'll say, worst case scenario, we'll just have to reboot to 2012 or so. How do they view and how do you view the export of the, the ISIS brand into both ISIS-directed and, and ISIS-inspired attacks in the developed world? They still have um, a, a lot of power to attack targets in the West and to, even to develop provinces overseas. So Musa Cerantonio, we discussed before, he, he's now in jail, uh, and it's alleged that he was trying to get on, on a boat and go to ISIS territory somewhere. And I believe that that somewhere was the Philippines. So. They've already said, don't try to come to Syria. Our enemies have made that hard enough. But there are other territories that we control where you, the collective overseas uh, supporters of ISIS, can be really useful. And so the city in central Mindanao and southern Philippines of Marawi would be an example of that. It's, it's a city that is, um, for the time being, still under the control of ISIS, having been taken uh, last week from, from the, the central government of the Philippines. And that's what they're trying to do. They're, they're trying to grab territory in places that have long-standing issues of uh, unsettlement by jihadist forces, and at the same time, encourage people to attack in Paris, London, Manchester, United States. And they'll continue to be able to do that. They're, there's, there's no sign that they're um, exhausting their, their manpower, and they certainly are exa- aren't exhausting their, their weaponry, since at this point it just consists of of rented trucks and uh, knives. In the aftermath of these kinds of attacks, I don't know what to think about all the energy that is spent trying to decide whether this is a ISIS-inspired attack or an ISIS-masterminded attack. I, I, I understand why the latter would be of greater concern, or at least, or at least it would be something that would have to be followed because you want to be able to roll up whatever organization exists. And you know, there's, a, there's a level of sophistication that comes with people having been trained overseas and all that. But 
on some level, the the inspired, the merely inspired attack, I mean, what's often called a lone wolf attack, though most of these wolves aren't all alone, those are even scarier. I mean, th- those prove that ideas are sufficient, and these ideas spread really in the, in the, the friction-free environment of, of just human conversation and, and Twitter feeds. And the distinction between ISIS-inspired and ISIS-led, I feel like, is an instance of not seeing the forest for the trees, because the, the bigger issue is the phenomenon of, of jihadism worldwide. And that is a, an idea-born phenomenon that, as you say, at, at, at some point in the book, and as you just alluded to now, the most fertile ground to plant this, these sets of ideas is in these, these destabilized places where, above all, people will have a, a natural craving for security, right? I, mean, so you're, you're talking, I, mean, I think at one point you say that, that ISIS has even put feelers out into the Congo to see if they, they might set up shop there. I mean, you go to places where you find this pure Hobbesian condition of total stateless disorder and when the jihadists roll into town, this is what the Taliban did in Afghanistan you know, now decades ago. When the jihadists roll in, they say, you know, we're, we're going to give you order at a minimum. We're your saviors in that proximal sense. And then now let us tell you about all the other good things we're going to give you under the aegis of the one true faith. Yeah. So to speak first to the directed versus inspired attacks, you alluded to this too. And I, I think this is the 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 main reason the distinction is going to be important is that the directed attacks are just much worse than the inspired ones. Unfortunately, at this point, we have something that looks a bit like a data set for what actually causes an attack to to claim a lot of lives. Having ISIS actually direct it seems to matter an enormous amount. You get something that looks like Bataclan, which killed a huge number of people, compared to London Bridge, which was probably, we don't know for sure, but probably inspired and killed only, and I use that word advisedly, seven people. Remember, there were three guys with knives and a van who decided to do this and had plenty of time to plan it, and they killed only seven people. And, you know, I'm pretty sure, Sam, you and I could figure out a way to kill more than seven people in a more horrific way before I finish speaking this sentence. <laughs> so the, the people who have been um, fighting on ISIS's behalf in an inspired way have been pathetic in what they've done, and we would not want to see many more directed attacks. Except, except one, one thing, Graham, as I, I, w- I would point out, is that we have the example of Orlando, which is the, the only real difference there being that it happened in the U.S., where the perpetrator had ready access to firearms, and there you have something much more like a, a Bataclan level attack. Now we're talking 49 people killed by one person who didn't seem much more talented in his evil than, than the, the London attackers. That's true. You know, ISIS in some of its magazines, uh, magazine articles recently, ha- has suggested ways to, to, to kill people. And I, I won't repeat them right now, uh, but they, they're very sinister, and they would be, they're much more horror movie-like, uh, much more diabolical than, than what we've seen so far. The very fact that, that, that people haven't been able to operationalize these, these far worse ideas suggests to me that they're, they're still, first of all, very foolish tactically, and um, kind of grasping at straws a bit, too. You know, it, it, it's, they're not people who are great at planning things. And thank goodness for that, because if they were, I think, yeah, an Omar Mateen scenario would probably be more common than, it, than it's been. Usually it's just someone gets a, a knife in the back on a train, and um, it's bad for that guy, but it's, 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 it's good that it's not hundreds of people instead it's just one. You know, you mentioned this, this issue of instability. And yeah, I spoke to a Central African intelligence chief who, who said that in his country there had been dozens of ISIS supporters. And especially as Libya and Syria became hard to travel to, they'd been looking elsewhere. And Congo was one place that they had actually sent people on behalf of ISIS to investigate as a possible province and the ability to try to investigate the, the possibility of building a state there. Um, I would just point out that this might be a, a, a point of agreement between 
you and me and also th those who who urge us uh, to look at the the political background of the of the places where where ISIS is is operational. I mean, it's not irrelevant that that a place would have no government and that people would be willing to look to ISIS as just a source of of stability. What I think that the people who want to stop there in their analysis get wrong is that ISIS uses that opportunistically. They say, okay, we will provide that stability. In exchange for that, we will be able to tell you how to properly live your lives and what the nature of God is and the violence that you're obliged on his behalf to wreak upon your neighbors. So it, it's, it's, it's sometimes suggested that, that we need to look only at the politics, only the social background, or only on, at U.S. foreign policy. It's not irrelevant what those form, that foreign policy is or what those pol political situations are. But it, I, I think w w what people mistake is using religion, religion opportunistically for those political ends, when often it's those political means being used for religious ends. And that, in fact, is, is how things have shaken out in the case of ISIS. It's an important point, and it's important that we are not really ever tempted to ignore that variable in our analysis. You know, I, I just raised it myself, but it's as you say, it's it's relevant, except in cases where it's actually not relevant. I mean, I'm still I'm still with John Georgilis in his basement, right? <laughs> He's sitting in his you know rich Colonel Father's radiologist basement, playing the video game of world domination, and the fact that that's possible simply speaks to how important the ideas are here. The fact that you can leverage political instability into some future caliphate, that, that seems just transparently so. And the fact that there are many places on earth where jihadists can plausibly pursue that project, whatever happens to the Islamic State in, in Syria and Iraq, that's obviously a topic of future concern. One question I have for you, though, is why, when you, when you talk about how important training is here in, you know, in a battle-hardened experience in maximizing the death toll and therefore the risk to open societies, why don't countries like the UK deny people entry back into the country once they've gone off to fight with, with ISIS? They seem to be doing the opposite. They, they seize people's passports so that they can't go fight with ISIS. But why don't they let them go fight and just never let them back into the country? Well, they don't really let them back into the country. If, if you make it back to the UK and you fought on behalf of ISIS, then you've already committed a crime and you're, you're going to go away for a long time. Um, there has been a, a, a theory that I think um, Russia and perhaps also France have in effect pursued, which is better they go over there and never come back. And we will not will not really stop them from going. Uh, and that, that theory has not really worked out very well. We found that, that the people who do make it back are so dangerous that it was probably better that they had never gone in the first place. The training that they get over there makes them extremely um, disinhibited, awful killers. Um, and so you don't want to send them over there. So you, you find there, there was a report in the Wall Street Journal recently about teams of French commandos who are in Iraq and Syria right now with a deck of cards style list of Frenchmen who are in Iraq who they need to make sure never come back. And that's really the, the thing that, that's not well understood and, and hard to stomach, frankly, from those of us in the West, which, which is there is a war of annihilation being fought right now in Iraq and Syria against the people who we either decided to let go over there or who made it over the, there despite our efforts and who might want to come back someday. We're doing everything we can to make sure that those people all die. And that, frankly, is understandable. I mean, it just these recent terrorist attacks, again, put these concerns very vividly in everyone's mind. And then there's a half-life to this response, and we then kind of just go back to sleep and then wait for the next big attack. But what this does is put our commitment to free speech also on the table to be reconsidered. And, and I, I must say, I mean, I'm, I'm a 
basically a a free speech absolutist. I mean, I consider myself someone who supports a person's freedom to espouse bad ideas, even patently dangerous ideas, as long as it's only that, just the communication of ideas. So, I, you know, neo-Nazis in, in this country or people who I would never want to give a platform to, I think, should be free to speak and, and organize. And But I'm wondering, it just seems like the details of what's happening in, in the UK now really are putting that to the test. So, for instance, as many of our listeners probably know, in, in the most recent attack in London, you know, one of these guys who ran over people on London Bridge with a van and then jumped out and started stabbing people, you know, he was featured in a Channel 4 documentary, The Jihadist Next Door, and we now know he was well on the radar of authorities for a very long time. He had actually physically attacked, I think, a, a colleague of, of Majid Nawaz is at Quilliam. As someone said on Twitter, you know, these KG jihadists are eluding capture by appearing in documentaries on jihadism with jihadist in the title, right? But this is all happening under the rubric of we have to tolerate these bad ideas, no matter how bad, and we can't move preemptively to infringe the liberties of of anyone who's claiming to be a jihadist. And it's easy for me to imagine that my free speech absolutism is vulnerable to a terrorist attack that happens too close to home. Or even just when I see the, uh, again, referencing this Channel 4 documentary, when I see what it's like in certain sections of London or in other cities in the UK, where you have steely-eyed maniacs standing on a street corner with a bullhorn, shrieking day after day about how they're planning to kill and enslave their neighbors, right? How long can free societies tolerate this behavior when, again, it gets punctuated by attacks of the sort we're seeing and we've seen in the UK in the last few weeks? Some of the people who were involved in that London Bridge attack were part of this group called Al Muhajirun, which is led by the now imprisoned um, Anjum Chowdhury, who who is the bullhorn guy in chief, screaming on street corners for years about how much he loved how much he loved ISIS. I think when Theresa May talks about uh, curtailing the access to social media of of ISIS supporters, it's understandable. It's also misguided. Uh, I I, w- <laughs> I think it's ridiculous that it took as long as it did for Twitter and others to kick Anjum Chowdhury and his followers and I- other ISIS supporters off their platforms. But I got to say, I'm I'm American enough to think that that. Uh, in the end, I want these ideas to be out there. I want them if they're if they're if someone believes them. I want that person to be loud with that bullhorn rather than secretly um, hanging out with his friends and conspiring to do something. I, I, I want that person to be uh, as identifiable as possible, so so that we can react when it's starting to look like he's he's um, putting his ideas in, into action. Most of the people who are are in this 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 group in the UK are, I think, um, known to authorities. It's not, a, not, it's not a surprise that we find that each of these attackers in Manchester or in, um, in London has let all of his neighbors know that he's a scary guy. Uh, they're always aware of that in advance. And it's, it's really for the best that they've been encouraged to be as loud as they have. It doesn't tax my um, belief in free speech very much at all. What does it mean to act against them preemptively? You have to imagine it's requiring some level of surveillance that fans of civil liberties will find a source of discomfort. What do you do when it becomes patently obvious that a person has nothing but the most treasonous and dangerous intentions for your society? We are listening to everything he says. What are you to do when it becomes unignorable? I don't have a great answer for that. We could take the example of John Walker Lind, who my reading of of his correspondence is that he, when he is sprung free in a matter of um, less than two years, I guess, he is, is going to be an ISIS supporter. He's going to be a free man who is uh, 
legally permitted to to have his uh, disgusting beliefs. And it won't be until he buys a knife and lunges at someone that, that he has, has done something obviously criminal. I, is that ideal? Uh, obviously not. He might not, of course, do anything like that. He might not even be an ISIS supporter, but the words that he spoke to me certainly suggest that he has more sympathy for the group than, than, than we should be comfortable with. And he, he would be, I think, a paradigmatic example if he does have those beliefs of, of someone who the utmost vigilance would be reasonable by law enforcement. But I, I can't find myself advocating anything more than, than what our current norms of civil liberties would allow and watching even someone with as dangerous ideas as, as, as I suspect he has. And what do you think about the prospects of actually winning a war of ideas here with the Muslim community so that this problem of jihadism gets retired to distant history the way the problem of, you know, in the burning of witches or some analogous religious craziness is just a distant memory in Christianity. I mean, when you, when you look at the efforts of someone like Majid Nawaz to try to inspire a core respect for secularism and liberalism as the, the antidote to jihadism and even, even variants of Islam that are just far too conservative to be compatible with, with our notion of human rights and, and political equality and tolerance for homosexuality and all the rest. How do you view those efforts circa 2017? I don't have a lot of confidence in the changing of, of the minds of people who are supportive of ISIS. Um, there are cases of people who get tired of being with ISIS. There are people who, who decide that ISIS had the right ideas but the wrong implementation. There aren't that many examples of people who really believed in ISIS and no longer do so. Most of them go over there, they believe, and then they die, and that's the only thing that stops them from, from their true belief. Um, the good news, though, is that it's still a pretty small number of people, 40,000. This doesn't sound very small. And of course, there's many more who haven't gone. But as a percentage, it is uh, not as... The, the number of Christians who believe that witch burning was something that, that should happen, uh, that was part of their faith. It was probably larger than the number of people who are Muslim and believe that ISIS is on the right track. Now, those numbers, um, small as percentage, are large enough to concern me, of course. I also think that, that there's uh, enough of a churn, a stylistic churn uh, of, um, of ideas that ISIS being cool right now uh, among people who are looking for a, a, a kind of violent outlet to their to their theological musings, it, it may not be cool in the passage of a generation or so. I, I I I don't like the numbers as they stand, but I also don't have a lot of confidence in those numbers holding for for the next generation. They might get worse. They might get better. It's um, we're not really in a position to 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 decide those things unless we're actually able to. Uh, to to annihilate enough people who 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 are reseeding them for for the next generation. Well, I'm going to seize on that as a a very qualified, hopeful note. Let's just both do our best, insofar as we can offer anything here to make ISIS seem even less cool than it in fact does at the moment. Yeah, here's to that. I, I'll say this: a after spending more than two years thinking about ISIS and to the exclusion of of most other things. I think it's less cool than ever. I also think it's uh, less scary than ever. You know, the, the more you learn about it, the more you find that, that it is a small, devoted, certainly religious, de religiously devoted core of people, but uh, its power to rule our lives and deform our politics has, has been greater than I would hope, but uh, it shouldn't be something that, that causes us to not go about our lives as, as we wish. And I, I wish people would have the same kind of uh, um, the same kind of confidence about about that that I get from from all my explorations of the topic. I'm even willing to vacation on an island in the Red Sea at this point. I'm <laughs> quite confident that we're on the on the winning side of this argument in the end. All right. Well, buy your ticket soon. Listen, Graham. Thank you for everything you're doing. You're you're, you're fantastic to read and uh, talk to. And um, I encourage our listeners to get your book because it really is a fun read and, and this problem 
while it may go away ultimately it's it's going to be with us i think for as long as we live please keep up what you're doing i know you i know you want to move on to other topics but don't completely forget about this one because you are um, one of the most reliable voices here thank you so much sam it's been a pleasure if you're enjoying the waking up podcast there are many ways you can support it you can leave reviews on itunes or wherever you happen to listen to it better still you can tell your friends about it or share it on social media. And if you really want to make sure this project endures, you can support the show directly through my website at samharris.org forward slash support. As a supporter of the podcast, you'll get early access to tickets to my live events, and you'll get exclusive access to my Ask Me Anything episodes, as well as to the AMA page on my website, where you can pose questions and vote on the questions of others. And please know that your support is greatly appreciated. It's listeners like you that make the show possible.